Yeah, our next speaker is uh, Jorge Hirsch um, from University of California, San Diego, and he will be talking about the dynamics of the Meissner effect, how superconductors expel magnetic fields. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you'll be interested and ask me a lot of questions. So I know this is not something most of you are working on, but uh, so. I'm going to tell you something about superconductors, which uh, do what these pictures show. Um, so the resistance goes to zero below a critical temperature, and they expel magnetic fields, which means when you cool them, they go from normal to superconducting, and a magnet that's sitting on top of it moves up. That is the Meissner effect, okay? And so the magnet moves up because a current started circulating in this metal when you cool it below the critical temperature. You can also do this in reverse and go from the superconductor to the normal system by heating. And that's a very important point I want to emphasize. The transition is reversible. So you can go back and forth and it's not going to involve any dissipation. It's a reversible phase transition. All right, so why am I here? Because uh, I think that this has something to do with things you know about, which is like this picture here. If you have a jet of uh, conducting fluid in moving in a magnetic field, as you know, because of the Lorentz force, there is a current that gets induced perpendicular to the motion of the fluid, and that generates a magnetic field that superposes to the initial field and bends the field lines, right? So let me take that picture, flip it around, and put it next to each other and they look kind of similar. So uh, if there are jets in the top picture that are bending the field lines, how about thinking about jets here that are pushing the field lines out? Well, BCS theory of superconductivity, which is universally believed to explain superconductivity, uh, says that superconductivity is a quantum effect that comes from interaction between electrons and phonons that I will not go into, but very specifically does not predict any radial motion of charge in the accepted theory. So I want, so basically it doesn't really address the question of how are magnetic fields applied, uh, expelled. So, I mean, you guys deal with MHD theory uh, every day, I suppose. So you know that Alphen theorem says that in a perfectly conducting fluid, the field lines are frozen into the plasma and the field lines move with the fluid, right? So if PCS theory says that there is no radial motion here, so do superconductors violate Alphen theorem? Because the lines move out, but there is no fluid moving with them. I mean, what, what about this? I mean, it's a very good conductor becoming a superconductor. How do we expand? Well, I want to tell you that I don't, I think that Alphen's theorem, in fact, is not violated, that in fact, Alphen's theorem explains the Meissner effect. Now, why haven't you guys explained the Meissner effect to solid state physicists a long time ago, if any of this is true? Let me tell you why. I think, because if you have flow of a fluid moving out and pushing out magnetic field lines, you're going to leave a hole in the center, right? And plasmas don't do this, right? I mean, you cannot just expel stuff. Well, the fluid that's flowing out has to carry zero charge and zero mass. And how does that happen? Well, let me just tell you the answer and then I'll explain it. The fluid that flows out is electrons and holes. The holes flowing out is the same as mass flowing in. So you, you, you can achieve this. Now, you probably are not very familiar or somewhat familiar with the concept of holes. Uh, William Shockley in 1950 wrote a whole book that uh, is based on explaining why holes are important in semiconductors. And uh, basically, a hole is the absence of an electron. These are energy bands. And when a band is almost full, you talk about the missing electrons as holes. All right, and he has a little garage analogy here. He says holes are very similar to electrons. But the reason they are not for superconductors uh, in particular has to do with the curvature of these curves that I uh, just drew here. And I'll try to explain why that is a key to what we want to understand, if I have the time. So 
what's the kinetics of the Meissner effect? We could think that we start with a metal in a magnetic field and then a current starts flowing in the surface that gradually makes the field, the field inside weaker. This we know for many reasons that it's not the way it works. And I don't have time to explain why, but we know that's not the way it works. Everybody agrees that it goes more like the picture here. You start to develop domains that are superconducting and the domains will grow outward and that way the magnetic field lines get expelled. And in the simplest version, we just have one single domain in the center that expands and in the process, the magnetic field lines move out. All right. So that's what we need to understand. And uh, so the superconducting phase will grow and as it grows, there is a current, there is a Faraday electric field and so on and so forth. If you think about the outward flow of a perfectly conducting fluid, it would do exactly the same thing. It would just move out and move the magnetic field lines out if it's perfectly conducting. So we need to understand what is flowing out. And I'm going to explain it in the simplest possible way with pictures. So Lorentz force is all we need. So let's say an electron moves from the inside out and then from the, from the just the Lorentz force, it will bend this way. And so in near the surface, it flows this way. It generates a Meissner current that opposes the applied field. Very simple. Now, how is angular momentum conserved? Because the electron uh, flowing this way carries angular momentum vertically like this out of the screen. Uh, and of course, there's also a charge imbalance. So let's think about the ions moving out. The ions are much heavier than the electrons. They will be bent by the magnetic field in this way. They will have angular momentum this way. They will not generate a big uh, magnetic field themselves because they are very heavy. Angular momentum is conserved, no charge imbalance, and we have solved the problem, but of course we have not solved the problem because the ions cannot move, right? The ions are fixed in the solid. So let's think instead about electrons that are flow back flowing, normal electrons that are back flowing. They will be deflected by the Lorentz force this way. Suppose they can transfer the azimuthal momentum to the ions, so the body as a whole starts moving, it compensates the angular momentum. And Meissner current is not cancelled because this is moving very slowly in this direction, the ions. So we are good here, but there is another problem here. This has to happen without any dissipation of joule heat. If the electron hits the ion and it uh, dissipates energy, that's bad because the process is reversible. And that's where the holes come in. And that is the magic of this hole. So if you look at the hole that is moving out, if you look at the forces acting on it, there's a Lorentz force pushing to the right. The electric, the Faraday field is pushing to the left. If the hole is moving at the same speed as uh, the boundary is moving that generates the Faraday field, forces are balanced. It moves radially out and the ion is going to pick up the momentum. And this picture doesn't explain it at all. So the way to understand it is you need to think about not the hole going out, but about an electron that's coming in. Let me show you how it works. It goes radially in both the Lorentz force and the Faraday force point in the same direction. And the reason it goes straight in is because there is a force from the lattice on the electron that compensates these external forces. And by Newton's third law, there is a force that is exerted on the lattice that moves the entire body this way and that compensates and this way, the angular momentum is transferred between the electrons and the body without any collisions in a reversible way. So, one minute more. Yeah. So, you know, to understand this, you need to understand a little bit about semi classical dynamics of electrons in solids, the concept of effective mass that is negative for electrons when the band is almost full. That's where the curvature comes in. The physics is that you push an electron in one direction. It moves in the opposite direction because this internal force of the ions on the electron that then transfers momentum to the ions. And that's why you need this force. So this is a picture that kind of shows the process in a little more detail, um, how the boundary expands and the electrons acquire this velocity through the Lorentz force and this backflow is what transfers the momentum. Now I want to very briefly talk about this 
uh, application of these ideas that say that because you have charge flow between superconducting normal regions in a magnetic field, when the boundary moves, you will have alpha-like waves along phase boundaries. And that's a prediction of this physics that you're not going to have if there is no uh, charge and mass flow as I'm describing. So you get these waves that basically say that if I have a system like this where I have superconducting in normal regions where there is a magnetic field and I perturb it, let's say over here, the, there's a wave that's going to be propagating and I, I can detect it down here. And this can be tested experimentally, but it hasn't been tested. And uh, so in particular, you can calculate, for example, the speed at this, which wouldn't happen if this physics wouldn't be going. Just to finish, let me point out that if you look at the periodic table, which materials are superconductors and which ones are not, you find that essentially 95% of the superconductors have positive hole coefficient, which says they have hole carriers, while materials that don't have hole carriers don't become superconductors. All right, so here is a summary of what I just said, and I guess I'm out of time, so. Yeah, thank you, Roger. We have time for one question. Please come to the microphone so the uh, remote, yeah. uh, no, it's over there. So the remote uh, speakers can hear you, remote viewers. Okay, uh, I just say this is a really nice analogy, um, but I was just curious about uh, how does the energy work out? Because when you expel the magnetic field, then you're putting energy into the system. Of and course. Yeah. So, so, so what are the energetics of this? The energetics, uh, BCS describes the energetics very well. When you go into a superconducting state, there is a lowering of energy. Now you pay energy, which is H squared over eight pi to expel the magnetic field, but there is something called the condensation energy that when you go into this state and it comes from Coulomb interactions. And I didn't talk about that at all. The real, no, no, they are involved. Yes, the Coulomb interaction between the holes lowers the energy. It's a kinetic energy lowering, but it's a, a very long story. Uh, but the point I want to say is BCS talks about energy, but it doesn't talk about momentum. And the key here is momentum. And uh, the conventional theory doesn't address that at all. Thank you, Roger. We have to transition.